If you look up hip hop, contemporary, jazz, tap, modern, or ballet dancer on Google, with usage set to commercial and other licenses, these are the first images that you will find. Try it if you don't believe me. Let's take a look at these dancers on the screen before you. At first glance, the only remarkable property of this set of photos is the talent of the dancers and the stock image symbol on some of the photos. But let's take a closer look. Our hip hop dancers are white and boy, and every other picture here is a white and girl. If we knew everything about the world just from these pictures, we'd think that 100% people are white and thin and 83% are female. Is that true? Well, of course not. But if we look within the world of dance, it's a little closer to accurate than we'd like to think. My name is Kyra Friedman, and today I'll be talking about solving inequality in dance. Dance is a beautiful art form and sport, but it has a lot of problems. 57.6% of ballet dancers are white, and 71% are female. 79% of choreographers and 72% of artistic directors are men, and the average American ballerina weighs 85 to 130 pounds. Not only do most dancers fit this mold, all dancers are expected to. Those who don't are often made fun of or cast out by peers, non-dancers, and instructors. These problems demand solutions. My goal is to find the solutions in play for each of these issues. One huge problem with dance is the availability of point shoes for dark-skinned people. Point shoes are expected to be the same color as the skin of a dancer, but are usually only widely available in a pink satin color. So what do black and brown dancers do if they can't get at the right shade? They have to color their own shoes. Sierra Robinson is a famous black ballerina who said that she had to use foundation makeup to color her shoes. And that to keep the right color, she had to dye them often and went through five tubes of foundation every single week. This is very problematic because not only does it alienize black and brown dancers, it forced them to spend extra money to be dancers of their own race. Based off of the price of foundation and the frequency that needs to be bought, this could cost an extra $75 every week. Thankfully, some point shoe companies are catching up. Gator Minden was the leader in this respect, now the prime example of an inclusive point company. They sell four sh skin shades of point shoes, pink, cappuccino, mocha, and espresso. Or in other words, pink, tan, light brown, and dark brown. Some other companies have added darker shoes are Capizio, Russian Point, and Fruit of London. I'd like you all to turn your attention towards the video on screen. This is an excerpt from a variation of the Chinese tea dance from the Nutcracker. Notice the mishmash of sequins on the costume. The fingers held, held up to imitate chopsticks and the mock Chinese music playing in the background. This is one of the less extreme examples of the blatant cultural appropriation in yellow face in the Nutcracker. In many variations of the dance, dancers wear white or yellow face makeup and draw on exaggerated eyeliner to imitate stereotypical Chinese complexions and eyes. You might be wondering what's going on here. After all, it wasn't necessarily intended to be disrespectful to Chinese people. Even so, it's problematic. When people impersonate another race, they create the race or culture that they impersonate as a costume, or worse, a form of entertainment. This is very wrong to do because every race is equal, and none should be displayed as something exotic or eye-catching to watch. Also, this dance incorrectly portrays Chinese culture, being based off of stereotypes rather than culture and tradition. So how is this being fixed? Despite a few complications, this is all being solved pretty well. Since the Balanchine Company legally owns the Nutcracker, they have to be contacted before any changes are made in the choreography or concept of this ballet when being used by professional ballet companies. Due to this, some companies could only change minor things before getting permission, such as turning the pointed fingers into normal ballet arms. After gaining permission, though, these companies have been able to entirely redo co costumes and choreography, some even changing the concept into a Chinese dragon dance, adapting the dance to fit the culture. Most companies no longer try to act as though their dancers are really Asian anymore, instead of either casting Chinese dancers or simply portraying non-Asian dancers as people partaking in Chinese traditions. Now, let's visit my dance studio for a minute. 
You walk in the doors, and there are girls making their way to the changing groups. Girls dancing inside the studios. Girls chatting in the kitchen. Girls doing their homework on old sofas in the main room. I can count on my fingers the amount of boys that attend and to dance classes there. You might think that dance is a girl's sport. You've definitely heard that it is. This belief is a product of gender roles, and it's one of the reasons that boys don't tend to dance. When children are raised thinking that they shouldn't do something, they usually don't. And they pass on the message as well. Of the few boys that chose to dance, 93% are verbally teased, and 68% are either verbally or physically assaulted. Nearly all taunts these boys suffer say something about being either girly or gay. This is of course a bad thing. Dance doesn't make a boy less male or trait, and also, neither being feminine or gay are bad things. Boys that dance are bullied and mocked for enjoying the sport, and often boys won't even consider dance an option. Thankfully, the tides are turning, and more and more people are starting to realize that dance is a gender-neutral sport. When Lara Spencer, a host of Good Morning America, taunted six-year-old Prince George for enjoying his ballet classes and, and claiming that his interest in dance wouldn't last, there was a public outcry. As seen on the right, hundreds of male dancers came and performed in front of her office in a peaceful protest. Apart from this, a boy named Brody Schaffer, or Boss Baby Brody on Instagram, has become an internet sensation. His mother, Danielle Schaffer, says that when Brody expressed an interest in dance classes, she signed him up immediately, not considering whether a boy should be dancing. When he was especially talented, she created an Instagram account for him to share his dancing which now has nearly 300,000 followers. This account isn't just a use of a dancer. It's a way of showing boys that everywhere they can dance. However, no matter how few men dance, they still rule the world of dance leadership. A whopping 79% of choreographers and 72% of artistic directors are male. Not only is that so, but the 20%, 28% of artistic directors that are women have a lower pay. 68 cents to every dollar made by a man. On average for all jobs, women make 82 cents to every dollar made by a man, meaning that there's an even bigger pay gap in dance leadership than in the rest of the world. Obviously, this is a bad thing. Women should have an equal chance to become choreographers and artistic directors as men do, and when they become one of them, they should have equal pay. This is the same belief held by Miss Ava Stone and Mr. Peter Bull. The pair, led by Miss Stone, created a workshop for advanced dancing teenage girls to learn how to choreograph pieces for themselves and to put them on the path to becoming successful choreographers. Ms. Stone says that the workshop was intended as a stepping stone towards choreography for women, but also as a workshop to help build creativity, time management, and collaboration skills. But last of all, one very overlooked matter in inequality is sizeism. That is, discrimination, discrimination against overweight people. A large amount of the population see obesity not only as a potential health problem, but as unattractive. This belief worsens when within the world of dance. Dancers everywhere are being pressured to become the thinnest they can for the aesthetic. Of course, this leads to two things. A lack of plus size dancers, and eating disorders and body dysphoria, and dancers that are already dancing. Dancers that are even slightly heavier than average are taunted by peers, told off by dance professionals and teachers, denied roles, and told things like, you're too heavy to go on point, your partner won't be able to lift you, and your legs can't fit in fifth position. Heavier dancers can indeed go on point and stand fifth position. And while in some circumstances they may be unable to be lifted by their partner, it doesn't make them unable to dance. Many ballet and dance girls don't require being lifted. However, the flip side of this problem is a rise in eating disorder in dancers. 12% of dancers have eating disorder, compared to about 9% for the rest of the world. Thankfully, efforts are being made both to include plus-size dancers and to help them with eating disorders. Overweight dancers from Cuba can now dance in a professional ballet troupe, the Danza Voluminosa, which means voluminous dance in Spanish. This company, founded by Joana Miguel Mas, has the goal of allowing overweight people to dance. As for eating disorders, some dance schools are providing support for their dancers with eating disorders. The Royal Ballet School in London has a nutrition policy to support anorexic and bulimic dancers, as well as dancers that are gaining weight. This document details how to spot signs of eating disorders and explains the company protocols 
when an eating disorder has been notified, no, noticed. Students are placed on a meal plan, should they have one, and their parents are notified. The document mentions that in the situation that dancers gain weight, the same rules apply that the meal plan is designed to help lose weight instead of gain it. While it is unfortunate that the dancers are essentially given the ultimatum that they either comply to weight loss or they leave the school, it's still a good way to keep these dancers from feeling insecure about themselves or becoming unhealthy. Overall, this plan is helpful to students with eating disorders. Dance is the home to many forms of inequality and injustice. These problems are starting to be fixed. Hoi Shoe companies are including dark skinned dancers, and the cultural appropriation and ballet co choreography is being toned down. Boys everywhere are learning that dance is an acceptable hobby to pursue, and meanwhile, girls are being taught that they can not only be dancers, but that they can also become leaders and choreographers. Dancers with eating disorders are being helped instead of complimented for their weight loss, and overweight dancers are finding a way to fit in without changing who they are. But even with all this improvement and change, the dance world still has a while to go before it's fixed all of its problems. The goal of complete equality has not yet been achieved. As long as a few people out of a group can be deemed the most suitable for dance, there's still farther to go. I take it upon the listener not only to acknowledge that anyone who chooses to dance can dance, but to truly believe it. Because there's only so much that can be achieved by programs that help maybe 20 girls a year learn to be choreographers, or ballet companies for overweight dancers that only have six cast members. The change needs to be in the system itself. The hope is not for a time when there are specialized classes built for every young different from the molds, but for a time when the mold includes anybody who chooses to dance.